By way of introduction, let me just talk about the theme of this panel, which was really um, initially about fossil fuel subsidies, <clears throat> which we agreed, I think, uh, across a large group of us that these are quite common and resilient, um, even though lots of efforts are made to cut them. Um, and they're also environmentally damaging, as well as quite, quite grossly inequitable, but nevertheless resisted. Uh, particularly by low-income urban groups. So we wanted to open up a discussion really for um, to think about uh, citizen participation in, in energy reforms um, and also about the, the ways in which energy features in everyday life and everyday political culture. Um, I think we'll probably uh, get started shortly. Let me just introduce first our first speaker. Um, Pedro, oh, I had your bio in front of me and now it's gone. Um, Pedro uh, works at Flaxo and he has an MSc in energy systems and a, a PhD from Flaxo in the area development studies. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today. Your title of your um, paper is, is rather brilliant, which is fossil fuel subsidies lived happily ever after, Rontio rationale behind the Ecuadorian case, quite a famous case in fossil fuel subsidy reform studies. Over to you, Pedro. Hello. Afternoon to you all. You can hear me. This is my presentation. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for uh, switching the time I speak. <laughs> uh, well, I um, try to locate this uh, presentation in a wider academic debate on the relationship between natural resources extractivism and underdevelopment in the global south. Yeah, the countries you see in color are what the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development calls commodity dependent, or countries that have more than the threshold of 60% of commodities in their exports. And this is precisely a characteristic of the global south. <clears throat> in many of these countries, not only the economy depends on natural resources exports, but also politics, international relations, and even inter-societal relations. Uh, in order to study the manifold effects of extractivism, I focus on the case of Ecuador. The country has been traditionally incorporated into the logic of the world economy through its natural resources. More recently, through oil. Ecuador experienced two oil booms in the last half century. During these periods, the 1970s and the 21st century commodities boom, the Ecuadorian state aimed at breaking dependence on natural resources by promoting other sectors of the economy. Such failed attempts of economic diversification might be also regarded as a characteristic of the global south. A concrete example of trying to break dependence on natural resources has been the recurring intention of supporting the national oil industry in order to promote the export of oil products instead of crude oil. By the way, I'm showing uh, the cover of my dissertation, which was published uh, earlier this year. Uh, I can leave the link to download uh, afterwards. So a first finding, which also applies to other natural resource rich countries, of the global south, involves the struggles with multinational corporations for the appropriation of rent. Oil rich peripheral states make use of diverse strategies to appropriate a larger portion 
of rent and to become landlords of the riches contained in their national subsoils. For example, Ecuador established a state-owned oil company and successfully renegotiated contracts and concessions with multinational oil companies during its first oil boom in the 1970s. Also, Ecuador integrated the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, during both oil booms. According to Terry Lynn Carl, this initial bargain between the state and multinational corporations over oil rent leaves a heritage of over-centralized political power. I might add that the appropriation of a larger portion of oil rent endowed the Ecuadorian state with relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis society and social classes. With relative autonomy, the Ecuadorian state became the arbiter of local rent distribution. The state might invest then in developmental purposes, such as infrastructure, yeah, and even in social programs involving public health and education, thereby regulating the relationship with society. Another forms of rent of state-led rent distribution are low taxation and granting subsidies. I'm referring today only to the subsidies on oil products, gasoline, diesel, liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. Such subsidies exist in Ecuador since the beginning of the first oil boom in 1972. More than 90% of the Ecuadorian population uses liquefied petroleum gas for cooking. Subsidies on transportation fuels, gasoline and diesel, were thought to benefit lower classes, but they rather benefit middle and higher classes. Whereas lower classes benefit from cheap and efficient diesel-based transportation, middle classes and higher classes benefit from cheap gasoline for their private car or cars in plural. What is more paradoxical is that being an oil exporting country, Ecuador is a net importer of oil products. Ecuador imports about 70%, 7-0, 70% of the domestic demand of transportation fuels. And nearly 90%, 9-0, 90% of the domestic demand of gas for cooking. The domestic refining capacity has barely been upgraded since 1978. As the domestic consumption is still growing, the fiscal pressure for the Ecuadorian state is snowballing. Just to recall, the Ecuadorian state pays international prices for oil products and offers them to the consumers in Ecuador at a subsidized price. The cost of importing oil products is about 6% of GDP per year already. The last attempt to scrap the subsidy on gas for cooking was made in 1996. It was the last straw for former president of the Bukaram. He was removed from office and since then no other government has seriously faced the problem of gas for cooking. The last attempt to scrap subsidies on transportation fuels was made two years ago, but street pressure forced former president Lenin Moreno to repeal the measure in only two weeks. So as society further relies on state-led rent distribution for subsidies, for example, the fiscal contract weakens. What I mean, social classes and even the social formation rely 
on state-led rent distribution. It is generated by the sale of natural resources overseas, more than it relies on the national economy and taxation. The case of um, Ecuador opens the gaze for a, for a wider academic debate on many issues. I would like to draw attention on one of them. In further research, we should focus more on the bargain between the state and society. This is not the initial bargain I mentioned before between the state and multinational corporations over the appropriation of rent. This is more the bargain between the state and society over the distribution of those rents. In Ecuador, people's demand of cheap oil products might be regarded as a claim on the portion of rent. In this sense, cheap oil products are regarded as a quasi-naturalized right by peoples living in oil exporting or in oil rich countries. Indeed, these subsidies have persisted in Ecuador for half century as a landmark of its oil era. And questioning the foundations of such rentier bargain between state and society means altering the state society relations and results in political turmoil as shown in the Ecuadorian case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was brilliant and even shorter and sweeter than I thought. You've actually got five minutes left. So if you want to say anything more, you can. Um, and perhaps we can discuss the environmental part of this exposition in the, during the questions. Absolutely. And I think you've picked up some stuff that I know other people in this group are very interested to talk about, which is the everyday um, experience of energy, but also the way in which it forms part of the the, the social bargain, the social contract between citizen and state. I think that's a really critical emerging issue. Well, thank you very much. Um, we are going to move straight on to uh, Devanshi and Patrick now, um, who are going to, whose paper is called, If the Gas Runs Out, We Are Not Going to Sleep Hungry, The Everyday Jugad in Securing Household Energy in Critically Polluted Central India. Jugad is struggle, I think, is it? Um, and we have here Devanshi Chanchani, Dr. Devanshi Chanchani, who's from the Un Brunel University in London. And she is a research fellow, a Global Challenges Research Fellow, um, and uh, has a lot of very interesting research um, uh, to her name. And she is uh, presenting with Patrick Oskerson, who is, as he said earlier to us, those of us who were here earlier, at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, is Associate Professor and vice head of division and focuses um, a lot on resource politics. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say. I will hold up a card or let you know when you have five minutes left. But as I say, you've got 15 minutes. So you know, maybe Thank I've been you. a little bit too strict. <laughs> I'm going to try and figure out how to share screen and so on. So thank you very much. Uh, Patrick and I have been working on uh, this uh, this research project together, and I'm going to present um, present this particular paper, which is on one aspect of the study. Let me figure out how to share my screen first. Is it not allowed? Oh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. So yes. So this is a study that um, that uh, Patrick and I have uh, have been uh, undertaking in uh, in a state in central India. It's a it's a part of this particular paper is uh, something that's just going to be out uh, very soon in uh, uh, in a, in the journal Energy Research and Social Sciences. But it's uh, this uh, this paper is part of a larger research project that we have on on uh, citizen science, air pollution, health, and, and uh, of course, domestic fuel use as well in, in, um, in a state in central India, as you can see in the top right uh, photograph, that's um, Chhattisgarh is the state that our research is based in. 
And this particular paper is on domestic fuel use and the variety of you know, domestic fuels that are used in, uh, in an urban context. So a lot of the research that has focused on solid fuel use in India has actually focused on rural communities. And what we are looking at is the urban poor and the urban precariat on which there has been relatively little um, you know, research in this area because the idea is that solid fuel use is largely a rural issue, a rural problem, and that the urban poor or the urban uh, urban India has made the transition. But what we're kind of talking about is, you know, that this is really very much an incomplete transition and, and uh, we're kind of unpacking, um, unpacking the status um, and, and the processes of, uh, uh, of domestic energy use in, uh, in, for the urban poor. So um, as I said, uh, this is a, uh, this is a state, Chhattisgarh is a state with a, you know, with a, uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, natural resources, in particularly coal, and it is a state from which there's a lot of, uh, you know, a, coal, a lot of industries are based on coal, and coal travels from this, uh, this uh, region to the rest of India, um, and Korba, which is one of the sites of our research. So our research is based in two sites. One is Korba, which is an industrial town in, in uh, Chhattisgarh, and also Raipur, which is the capital city. And uh, both of uh, and our, the sites of our research have been uh, uh, low income uh, um, neighborhoods in industrial parts of the city or, or uh, Korba pretty much is a pretty much entirely an industrial town. Raipur has an industrial suburb, Urla, which is where uh, some of our, uh, our field-based um, engagements have been. And uh, the research largely relies on qualitative methods in data generation as well as uh, uh, picking up air pollution date, uh, air pollution measurements, so measuring air pollution uh, through the use of uh, low cost uh, air pollution uh, monitors. Um, and of course, it speaks to the whole topic of the transition to clean fuels, which is, of course, very important in terms of the global efforts towards making a transition to uh, cleaner burning fuels. Um, I'm not able to. Yeah, right. So this is uh, this is a picture of uh, an, a usual evening or morning. These are pictures from of a usual evening or morning in coal town, Korba, which is what we call it. And um, uh, so this, is, as you can see, you can see the you know the chimneys at the back. You have uh, you know steel industries, power plants, and they're constantly spewing black smoke. So you have the ambient air, levels of air pollution, are, of course quite high and at the same time adding to that you have uh, you know like the at the habitation level a large use of coal among other fuels such as lakadi and uh, uh, and as we'll see further a whole range of fuels that are used but the whole neighborhood is engulfed in in smoke and we have these uh, air pollution monitors that pretty much max out in terms of the uh, uh, morning, evening uh, levels of PM uh, 2.5 that they measure. So it kind of uh, maxes out a thousand and you can see it kind of totally, and we, we place these air pollution monitors in people's homes and within the lanes of the community. And you can see that, you know, the, the monitor is not able to capture it beyond the point. So you have the morning, evening, morning, evening peaks uh, to the, to the, uh, to the air, I mean, in the air pollution measurements that we are picking up. And what you find is that people, are very very happy to live with with these levels of uh, of air pollution and often I mean you know they follow us around in the community and say you know we're going to show you a house where there's very high levels of pollution so uh, as a friend of ours says uh, you know they've really accepted air pollution as a family member so that's the level of uh, comfort that there is with uh, with uh, living with uh, with air pollution um, and and I mean this is just kind of also interesting in terms of context to place the whole discussion of the transition to clean fuels where air pollution itself has very little, I mean, it matters very little in, in, in the whole scheme of things and in the whole scheme of uh, reasoning for communities in, uh, in, in their fuel choices. Um, right, so as, as we know, and of course, would as this this audience uh, knows very well, the shift away from solid fuels is is of course uh, important from the perspective of, of course climate change, given all the carbon emissions, and of course for improving public health as suspended particulate matter um, 
from, from, from such burning has multiple health implications and is an underlying cause of morbidities, uh, respiratory conditions, and of course, premature death. And this speaks to the whole, you know, transition towards uh, affordable and clean energy, which is um, SDG as well. Um, and, of, and as we know that women and children are particularly affected by, by indoor air pollution and, and smoke from cooking fuels, um, given that they are usually, of course, often, often gathering and producing the fuels as well as, uh, as, as in the kitchens where uh, they are experiencing the smoke from, from uh, such fuels. And given this large widespread use of um, solid fuels, there's been several decades of both research and intervention to shift to cleaner fuels or to vent smoke away from households. So for instance, there's been decades of work on smokeless chulas, or, or which, which basically vent the smoke away from, your, from the habitation away. But mostly, by and large, we found that these, the transition has been very much incomplete in rural areas. And, and also we find even in urban areas that there are persistent challenges to transitioning to clean fuels. And, and this is where our kind of research tries to kind of speak to what might be some of the underlying factors that we need to consider and, and um, what might be some of the persistent challenges and, and uh, ways in which we need to think about and look at uh, communities and their fuel choices. Um, so yes, yeah, so of course, and, and what we are pointing to and, and talking about is really the importance of qualitative research in such uh, efforts, given, given that we've not quite been able to escape the chula trap. Um, so what we find in these urban neighborhoods is, uh, and we take the perspective of, um, of cooking fuels in, in, in these neighborhoods as being produced uh, rather than just available. Because, you know, while like you, this, these photographs show that, you know, coal, uh, that, um, that, that families are picking up coal from railway tracks because it's a, it's a region from where uh, coal travels to the rest of the country. It's, it's a, every morning you find, uh, find people who'll, who'll gather coal, a handful of coal just for that particular day. So while that coal is available, we, what we are saying is that the whole range of factors determine whether or not that can actually be used. So we're using the lens of, of fuels here as being produced. And similarly with chena and, um, and what we, and um, which is of course cow dung cakes. Um, and here what you see is a really innovative kind of way that people have come up with using uh, the dust that remains from uh, industry, uh, which is then converted into these coal laddus, which is uh, in India, the laddu is a sweet, but basically a coal cake, um, which is, which is mixed in with mud and uh, with cow, with uh, of course dung and uh, hay from rice, and uh, I mean really innovative kind of way in which to make coal dust, which is a residue and not usable by industry, available and usable for as a backup fuel option, uh, along with gas, which is of course um, also now increasingly the supply of which is um, more reliable. Um, yeah. What we find, I mean, and, and I think what, what we found is that there's a very highly fluid scenario of domestic fuel use. So in a lot of the literature, I mean, of course, the literature also recognizes that there is multiplicity in fuel use, but a, a, a dominant kind of way in thinking about fuel transition has been this idea of the energy ladder, where, you know, consumers are viewed to be uh, uh, as neoclassical uh, actors, uh, kind of moving very systematically from uh, tr from traditional fuels and solid fuels to cleaner burning fuels and, and more expensive cook stoves as their incomes increase. But what we find is that there's a, there's a lot of fluidity here and that people move back and up and forth, back and down, <laughs> uh, up and down the ladder um, uh, using a range of uh, very purposeful strategies that are guided by very much by the here and now. And I use the term jugadu, which is a, a, a colloquial term for a workaround or hack, very much here and now, day-to-day -day kind of approach. Um, and what you find is that very often women tell you, if the gas runs out, we will not sleep hungry. We will, we will work something out, you know? And there's a huge dependence on family networks, um, 
to make uh, uh, rural uh, fuels from rural uh, parts of the uh, of the region available. So, for instance, lakdi is something that's uh, is a fuel that's quite convenient for people to use, but very very expensive in urban areas. So, uh, you know, huge dependence on family networks to make that uh, available. Um, so, so that is one thing. You know, this whole this very uh, fluid uh, scenario. Uh, the other is also a real uh, difference that we find between migrants and long-term residents in, in these sites. And this is, again, something that we find that policy is not necessarily uh, quite understood. Um, uh, I mean, migrant workers find it particular, I mean, they're obviously at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, in many ways because they're renting uh, houses uh, in these loca locations. And then they're, the, they're also the ones who, because they don't have the huge family networks in these regions are also you know, um, quite dependent on, I mean, would like to have gas, but often are not able to because they don't have the paperwork for it. And then the other thing that we found that was really interesting in this, uh, in this, um, in these neighborhoods was a big, dif was that the relationship between income and gas use, while in household economics and income clearly matters, there were all kinds of, um, of variables that uh, mediated it. So one important one was uh, that the difference between large versus small families. So five while, minutes, yeah? Yeah, five minutes, sure. Uh, while large families um, often had higher incomes, uh, they, were, they were better established, but they also had the family resources to continue to use solid fuel. So that was another factor that we found because they had the women who'd go out there and, and collect and gather and produce these fuels that we, we're talking about and as well as uh, the you know the, the longer time that it took to use these fuels for cooking in large quantities so income was not always the only only criteria where smaller families were you know uh, perhaps the in, in, smaller incomes were still constrained by time and would spend a very large uh, proportion of that on on gas um, and again, so that so that was the other uh, finding. The, uh, and of course, household in, in economics clearly, household income and economics clearly matters, as we'll see. I mean, this is of course very uh, apparent to anybody in terms of neighborhoods that use almost entirely gas, and that of course has a, a, a income. Um, uh, uh, I mean, clear income criteria uh, working there. Um, the other other thing that we found is that there are few, if any, cultural barriers. LPG was used or gas was used as aspirational, desirable. And there's a lot of literature that tells you in, in rural areas that there are all of these cultural barriers to making the shift to LPG use. We didn't find that except for a very rare instance in uh, the urban context. And then the other thing that we found is that our, um, because of the high fuel fluid scenario of domestic fuel use that we're talking about, that this has in our view, really important methodological implications for the study of domestic fuel use, because what you find is that costs are very variable. So to really understand what households are spending and how they're spending and what they're spending on fuels is not very easy to capture in quantitative surveys. And a longer term perspective is really important, is something that we felt was very important and not very well understood. As I've said, pollution is a bottom marginal consideration. And I'm going to end with this one slide on the prime, on the Ujwala Yojana, which is the government scheme to make the transition towards um, uh, towards a use of LPG, also in rural populations, as well as urban um, low income groups. And the, just a few um, observations with respect to this scheme. So as I said, the scheme is for aiding the transition to cooking gas. So what it, it Tends to, uh, attempts to do is expand the net of users who have a connection, a gas connection, and then uh, at, at a very at, at a token price, and um, and then the idea is that that communities will then refill their gas cylinder pretty much at market rates with the tiny little subsidy that anyway comes in for all users of gas, no matter what uh, income groups they belong to. Um, and what you find is that here, by and large. Most people who got the connection under the PMUI uh, or the Yojana were not quite able to refill the gas cylinders. And there were various reasons uh, for this. I mean, supply was by and large reasonably consistent, but 
Overall, the upfront cost of the gas cylinder continues to remain a very uh, significant problem. And what we found is that almost 90% of, of individuals were not necessarily refi not refilling uh, the cylinder. And, and the other interesting thing here was that the size of the refill cylinders is 14 kilos, which was um, about 1,000 to 1,100 rupees per month. And, and then there was this other cylinder as well, which you could come up with, which was a 5 kg gas cylinder, which, I mean, from a cash flow perspective would have been much, much more usable, but that's something that's not, um, that's not offered quite by the program. So these were just some of the observations we had with respect to this scheme. And there's of course much more, but I mean, I can't go into too much detail beyond this right now. Um, so just the overall implications is that there is a real need to kind of acknowledge the messy picture of urban energy transitions for the urban precariat, and also look at qualitative methods and longer term perspectives um, in both understanding the household energy mix, as well as informing policy, as well as research in, in, um, on, in examining this uh, domestic energy use. And yeah, so this is some, this is our uh, paper from this is just gonna be out at Energy Research and Social Sciences has recently been accepted and I hope to share it with you and get any feedback. Thank you. Many thanks Devanshi and Patrick. That's really very interesting. And congratulations on the paper. I was so interested to see that it's the Prodhan Mund, it's the prime minister's uh, uh, energy scheme, brightness scheme. So the yes. politics is very, very clear, isn't it? It's very important for Modi to have his face on it. Right, well, thank you very much. And uh, we're moving on now to our third and final presentation. I think Neil, you're going to kick us off, is it? Neil um, is a director of uh, the policy practice and also um, an associate um, fellow at IDS Sussex Institute Development Studies Sussex. Davide Natalini um, is based, he's a, he's a C, I think you're a senior research fellow, is that right, at Anglia Ruskin? And you're in, what's the name of your center? I've forgotten it, the Global Sustainability Institute. Is that right? Yes. Correct. And they've been doing fantastic quantitative work, which I'm nominally connected to, but I'm not talking about. So over to you, Neil. I will let you know when you've spoken for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, Devanshi, that was fascinating. But could you stop sharing your presentation? Then I'll share. I am trying to figure that one out. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's why I was wondering why it wasn't switching back. <laughs> I have some I have some questions for you, but we'll come to those later. Um, let me just get uh, this presentation uh, up for you. Can everybody see that? Okay. Wonderful. So uh, lovely to be with you all and uh, talking about my favorite topic, uh, uh, fossil fuel subsidies and fossil fuel subsidy reform. This is a piece of work which is part of the Action for Empowerment and Accountability Research Program that many of these papers have come from. Those of you who are with us this morning heard uh, great examples from Mozambique and, and Nigeria of the great qualitative work that's been done in both those countries and in Pakistan. But this is a paper uh, by myself, Davide, Naomi, and Patricia Justino, which is looking at a global perspective uh, and trying to understand uh, really a central question using uh, quantitative data, do fuel subsidies cause fuel riots? Um, so that's what we're, that's what we're about. Okay, so very quick um, uh, explanation of the data that we have uh, used. And most of this data uh, really is uh, the work of uh, Davide. Davide has painstakingly um, gone through media reports of fuel riots in 191 countries for uh, the years 2005 to 2018. I can imagine how long that must have taken in order to pick out specific instances of fuel riots, these are protests that entail violence, which were specifically about energy, um, usually about subsidy reforms of one kind or another. So we have this fantastic data set of 191 countries, uh, 59 uh, events overall, and then we've merged that data set with data from the IMF on the level of fossil fuel subsidies, uh, which we have from 2010 to 2017, as well as a whole pile of usual indicators you get from world development indicators, GDP, population, price of crude oil, and importantly, a set of political variables um, from the versions of democracy uh, data set and the worldwide governance indicators. So that's what our data uh, consists of. And we can argue about the details of that later if you like. And what do we find? What do we find is that fuel riots are both infrequent and also widespread. 
Um, this is a beautiful map that David put together, uh, which shows all of the countries which have had uh, fuel riots during the period 2005 to 2019. And uh, there are 41 countries over this period who have had at least one riot, and some of them have had several. Um, one country had seven, Indonesia's had three. Um, so um, this is a, a common thing in the sense that there are lots of countries that have experienced them. But of course, 191 countries over a period of uh, 14 years, uh, 59 is not actually a huge number in the big scheme of things. So this is both something which is very common, very widespread, but not doesn't happen every single day. Now, what causes fuel riots? Well, the most obvious and immediate thing that everybody immediately jumps to and says, well, it depends upon the oil price. Um, if uh, one has, if one fixes the domestic price of any kind of fuel, gasoline, diesel, or whatever, um, but you're importing that, then the international price uh, obviously is connected to the oil price. And so the gap between the international price and the domestic price gets bigger whenever the international oil price rises. So we should expect to see a relationship between oil prices and the number of fuel riots that we see, and that's exactly what happens. So what you see here is the number of fuel riots in the, are the blue bars there, and the international oil price is the red line. And you can see there's a very clear correlation. Uh, you tend to get more fuel riots during pe uh, periods when oil prices are high. Um, here's a prediction. You first heard it here, 2021 and 2022. We're going to see some more fuel riots. Why? Because the oil price is rising. There's a very clear and strong connection. <clears throat> However, um, oil prices is not the only thing, obviously, that drive fuel riots. And so we used our data set to work our way through some of the other possible things that might be associated or correlated with the existence of fuel riots. One of the most obvious is how rich a country is. So we look at log G GDP per capita and we discover, of course, that richer countries tend to have fewer fuel rights. Um, we also looked at GDP growth. And one possibility, one hypothesis is that countries that have just had a recession might be more likely to have a fuel right. That doesn't appear to be the case. There's no correlation there. However, it is true that bigger countries, in, in the sense of having a bigger population, do tend to have more fuel riots, although that may be simply a bias um, from the way in which our data is collected, because if it's a bigger country, you're more likely to get media reports about it, and that's the way in which we collected our fuel riot data. Net energy exporters are slightly more likely to have uh, fuel riots uh, than, um, uh, than net energy importers, not statistically significant, but it is almost so. But interestingly, and contrary to what many people think, it's not true that autocracies tend to have more fuel riots uh, than democracies. So the political regime doesn't matter. One thing that does matter is corruption. So any international measures of uh, um, uh, corruption and the extent of corruption with a country are strongly and positively associated with there being fuel riots. Civil society freedom is not, uh, interestingly. But the existence of an anti-system movement, that is to say, a, a non-state movement within of the country that is trying to overthrow the nature of the political regime within of that country, is strongly associated with having fuel rights. So these are some correlates um, of uh, fuel rights. But there's also another one, and a very important one, which we discovered during the course of our work, which we thought was very interesting indeed. And that is uh, about the fuel price regime. Typically, Countries that have fuel riots, um, or typically countries that have fuel subsidies, tend to have fuel subsidies because they fix the domestic price. So what we did was we um, uh, calculated the number of months that countries keep prices the same. And you can see in the horizontal axis here, the percentage of months with no changes in price. If you have zero months with no changes in price, that means you change pr fuel prices domestically every single month. If you have 100% of months, with no changes in price, that means the price is completely fixed. Um, so on the right-hand side of the scale, we have countries here which have completely fixed the domestic prices. And on the left-hand side, we have countries with completely flexible prices. And in between, we've got countries which change their prices every month or two or three. The vertical axis here is the typical size of the price change that you get when you do change prices. All countries change prices, they have to, because they can't hold on to a domestic fixed price forever. And what we found here was a fascinating sort of smoking gun as to why there's a relationship between the fuel price regime 
and feel riots. Because you can see for the vast majority of countries, the countries that shift their prices relatively fle flexibly and relatively frequently, the mean price changes are very small. However, for countries that tend to fix their prices for longer periods of time, more than 80% of the time, the mean price change whenever you do get a price change tends to be very large. The typical price change for flexible countries tends to be one or 2%. The typical price change whenever you actually uh, are a country that fixes your prices for a long period of time can be 20, 30, 50, 100%. And so obviously if 20, 30, 50 or 100% price rise, it's much more likely to induce a riot than a much smaller price change. So this issue of the price regime and whether it's fixed or flexible seems to be an important determinant. So I'm a quantitative economist, we're quantitative types, so therefore, um, not you, Naomi, but, uh, uh, but um, so therefore what we did was we did a regression. And in particular, we exploited the fact that we have a panel of data. That's really important in this instance, because not only do we have 191 countries, but we have them for 14 years. What this then allows us to do is to run a fixed effects panel regression, which sweeps away all of the characteristics of countries that might be correlated with there being a fuel riot, but which are also potentially correlated with uh, there being subsidies. In other words, we can isolate the impact of subsidies on whether or not there's a riot. And so you see here the model that we ran is on the left hand side, we have whether or not there is a riot for that particular country, country I in year T. And that's obviously going to be related to the size of the price shock, which is the delta P thing on the first thing on the left on the right hand side. And secondly, it's going to be related to the size of subsidies, plus some control variables, GDP and population, and dummies for every single year and dummies for every single country. So these are washing away what we call all of the fixed effects, which might otherwise influence it. And the results we get are quite remarkable. The result we get is, unsurprisingly, that price shocks are positively associated with fuel riots. That's the first thing you've seen there. Clearly, a big price shock makes it much more likely that you're going to get a fuel riot. That's not exactly a surprise. But the second line here is really interesting and surprising, which is that large subsidies are systematically and positively related to fuel riots. Why is that surprising? It's because countries that fix their prices are doing so out of a narrative, out of a rationale that says, we're trying to fix prices to protect people. We're trying to do something to help people. But in actual fact, the evidence from our data set would seem to show that countries that fix prices end up with prices which are more volatile than countries that move them all the time. There's an irony for you. And as a consequence, countries with large fuel subsidies tend to have more fuel riots than ones which uh, have lower fuel subsidies. Neil, five minutes. We've got... Um, Obviously, we've done all of the usual sort of robustness tests that um, uh, we have to do for these kind of econometric exercises. So uh, David has got another separate definition of fuel riots. So we use that definition um, in order to see whether or not we got the same result. We did. We also use different estimation methodologies, OLS estimation methodologies, logit method methodologies and so forth to see if we got the same result. We did. And we also use different sets of controls. And in particular, we introduced all of those political variables as well to see whether they might make any difference. They didn't change the result. So the fundamental result is that larger subsidies makes it more likely to get fuel rights seems to persist. So quickly, in summary, riots are negatively correlated with income and positively with being a big country, having more corruption and people wanting to change the system, that is, wanting to forcibly overthrow the system. Price shocks obviously drive riots, that's duh. Um, but large price shocks are particularly likely among countries that fix their prices more than 80% of the time because they require big macroeconomic adjustments. And that tends to give rise to much more disruption, which ironically means that a social contract, which is based on fuel subsidies, and that's the whole point, is that fuel subsidies are part and parcel of this social contract, actually makes people more vulnerable uh, to price shocks. And then finally, fixing prices causes large subsidies. So therefore, large subsidies are strongly associated with fuel rates. That's it. Thanks. Any questions? Ask Davide. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil and Davide. That was rather brilliant. Rather short as well. I can't believe how everyone has been so efficient with their time. Um, 
I wanted to, I, I will have questions, but um, I think I'm supposed to hand over to Mario because he's the discussant. But I did want to ask you about um, whether you looked at where there were big price changes and no riots and tried to understand what the characteristics of those places are. But anyway, it's up to Marioka now. Um, and we have, I, I should like to draw attention to everyone to the many, many comments already in the chat as well. So, um, you know, while you're getting ready to think of your questions, please look at the um, stuff that's already in the chat. Um, Marioka, um, five minutes for you. Or, as we have so much time, you have as, as long as you like. Uh, I think I'll probably need less than uh, than five. Um, and I'm also trying to uh, to um, draw some connections to the the panel this morning and the other papers that are part of the of the two panels, uh, basically. Um, thanks so much for uh, fascinating uh, presentations, and I really like. Just like in the in the morning that um, that we have Neil and Davide and Naomi and Patricia's paper with this broader um, narrative, the quantitative approach, and some nice case studies uh, that remind us of the real people that have to live with the fuel subsidies or the lack thereof, or with the pollution, etc. Um, one of the things that struck me, and that's that's mainly based on the first two presentations is how we need to, uh, how, how much we, we need to be thinking of class and uh, income uh, groups in this whole discussion and uh, how much we need the qualitative work also to help us think about who is using which energy source and for what, which in group, income groups rely on which energy sources for cooking, for transport, uh, and what, in, in Devanshi's words, what words, what do they spend and how they spend money on these different sources of energy? Because if we don't understand how, how energy and fuel uh, matters in people's lives exactly, we also miss uh, the point in, uh, in, some of, in, in how some of these shocks might be alleviated or mitigated. Um, uh, I also... Uh, liked uh, or liked it's very interesting how uh, corruption came up in the, the the paper by Neil and Davide and that of course speaks very much to uh, the other presentations also this morning around the social contract and uh, what people expect their governments to do uh, how uh, and and whether they trust or uh, an intervention or not a change in the prices or, or not and how they grasp that within their wider view you frozen right? state responsibilities and the, the did I there I think I'm back you're back now you're fine now yeah, yeah. um and so so my last few seconds were about the social contracts and how uh, so the so is there a dialogue possible between the speakers we have here in a possible in the panel of on these perceptions of corruption in relation to uh, the, the responsibility of the state in upholding the social contract when it's about fuel prices or energy provision. It's not just the price, I think. Um, I had a few questions also uh, to link the different papers together across the sessions. Um, so what uh, I had a question about uh, the reflection, some reflections in terms of the political economy that sustains the status quo in both India and Ecuador um, in terms of the... Uh, uh, so in, in India, knowing that it is a health hazard, uh, there is that scheme uh, that you mentioned, Devanshi, in the, in, the, in the final slide, but there will be other interests that want to sustain the existence of, the, uh, of these coal industries. So how does that play out? Uh, in Ecuador, I had this. I don't know that context very well. I had the sense there's less, um, there is there are fewer attempts to change uh, the subsidy schemes from within domestically. Uh, but could you reflect further on this wider political economy of of the of what sustains this, the the subsidy um, schemes? Uh, I had a reflection agency and creativity because I and that what what comes 
uh, comes out from across the papers is how many people just cope and find so many creative ways of dealing with finding their energy sources uh, to cook very powerfully in illustrated with the Vanshi's PowerPoint or, and how people collect the coal and the, and the dust um, as a way to get by, which is a different form of agency, like getting by the jugad, then confronting your state and asking for changes that benefit you. Uh, so could you reflect on that? Uh, where is the, the discontent? Uh, which, where is the, the, the local expression of discontent uh, in this? Um, I'm assuming in India people need the coal industry for jobs as well, maybe not just in the firms directly, but also all the services that emerge around the production line. So maybe there is that balancing of, uh, well, if there isn't the industry, then we don't have uh, all those other opportunities. Um, and how do the Ecuadorians uh, think about that? Uh, in, 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 is, what, what, is there any public grievance, public expression of, 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 of discontent about the, the situation of the, the extractive industry and the, the relationship between state and these corporate players that you mentioned? Is there still a sense of an unfair game? Um, uh, for uh, Neil and Davide, um, I didn't have as much time to think about your pre uh, uh, presentation, but of course I've seen the paper in the past as well. Uh, I would love to hear a bit more reflections on your, uh, on, on if you can, about the differences being between the better off countries, the wealthier countries and the, uh, the relatively poorer countries. Uh, and how the fuel subsidies sit within the social contracts in these different parts of the world, because it doesn't mean we're all very happy in, in the well-to-do countries that, that we just don't bother about complaining uh, about that. We, we complain about loads of stuff, but uh, so could you, could you say a bit more, or is that also, does that also have to do with the perception of corruption, perhaps? All right, that was it for me. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, Marioka. That's really great. I, I'm also struck by across these two panels this morning and today um, by the emerging connections between the everyday experience and use of energy and the kind of the social contract. So the way it feeds into the state society, state citizen relationship in form, forming the social contract or not forming the social contract. And I think this is something we want to reflect on a lot more. I think came through very nicely in your paper, Ivanshi, and also in yours, Pedro. We have some other questions also here. So what I'm gonna do first is return it to the speakers to comment on Marioka's comments, and I'll go backwards. So start with Davide and Neil, if that's all right, then Ivanshi and Patrick, and then Pedro. And then I'm gonna, uh, there's a bunch of questions in the chat uh, for everyone. So um, we'll return to those and then see what, what's left after that. Okay, Neil and Davide. Davide, you go first. Yeah, it's all with me. Um, so yes, maybe I'll start with uh, the question from uh, Ayu first. Uh, that is about the um, whether we have um, how basically we 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 take into account the fact that different countries can experience different types of regimes. So um, we use a specific variable for this that was basically it's an index that tries to capture different types of regimes and obviously this is calculated for every year um, and it's a variable that varies from zero to nine according to each sort of value uh, it takes on different types of regimes so for um, the database that we used for this was uh, varieties of democracy and it's a it's a very good database and basically yeah uh, we would have been able to capture uh, that difference in um, in, in the regime in the in our analysis simply because that would have been picked up by the uh, database for for Nigeria yeah. Um, and then shall I go with um, 
Naomi's question. Well, no, it? actually, I, I, if you could respond first to Marioka's comments, any any responses you have to, to what she had to say, and then we'll, we'll move on to the other questions after sure. that. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. And uh, Neil, do you want to go first and then I'll say? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Marioka. And this issue that you raised at the end there about the difference between the richer and poorer countries, I think is a really interesting one. Um, Michael Ross and Pasha Madhavi have done a paper that basically says that fossil fuel subsidies are something that countries grow out of as they get richer. Um, and, um, and that's an interesting perspective that it is true that richer countries tend to have lower fossil fuel subsidies and very much lower fuel rights. Uh, they also tend to not use consumption subsidies so much and they tend to use production subsidies, i.e. direct uh, tax expenditures for oil companies and the like much more frequently, whereas poorer countries tend to use consumption subsidies, i.e. fixing the domestic price much more. But um, to my mind, there's, there's two variables here. One is whether or not you've got better tools for, um, uh, for your social contract. Fixing a domestic price of a fuel is a really crude, simple and easy way of building, of giving something to the people. It's part of your social contract. I give you this. Oh, we're going to fix the price of the fuel. There, we've done something for you. It doesn't require very much by way of bureaucracy or administration. It's not sophisticated in the least. It, therefore, it's understandable for countries with relatively low government capacity uh, that this is an attractive option. Um, but as countries develop more sophisticated states and more effective states, fixing a price of a fuel is probably not the easiest or best or most targeted way in which you can actually deliver something, even if your intention is to give clientelistic benefits rather than actually generic benefits. It's simply not a good way of doing things. And so countries may evolve as they become uh, get more sophisticated um, into not using fuel subsidies and using other kinds of mechanisms. And as a result, they get themselves out of this sort of contentious politics of, uh, of, of fuel protests. So that may be one possible reason why we don't see uh, as many fuel riots in rich countries uh, as in poor countries. But it's debatable and we, we, don't, we can't prove that from our data yet. David? Uh, yes, maybe I can add some more thinking around it as well. I do think that um, by looking at, you know, throughout the data collection of the different fuel riots, I have obviously read a lot about different types of experiences and different events as well. Um, and um, I think that there is a case to be made whereby, although both uh, developing and developed countries, if we can call them like that, um, experience fuel riots, maybe the dynamics through which these happen uh, may differ. And um, obviously, the re because the analysis that we're making is so at the bird eye view, uh, it is very uh, difficult for us to isolate each specific case study, um, which is something that we do, for instance, with national case studies, right? But um, something that we are going to try to do is to try to understand whether there is a difference between um, the fuel rights that happen at uh, um, yeah, at the in, in developed like as you as for instance European countries and developing countries, and the reality of it is that um, these are usually triggered by uh, increase in fuel prices. Right now, the difference is between developed and developing countries is what triggers that. Um, uh, that, that, that price increase. Um, in developing countries, these, uh, for the case that, could, well, for, for the events that we've collected, uh, seem to be mainly triggered by uh, slashing uh, subsidies. But for um, developed countries, these tend to be, at least from the uh, mentioned um, uh, reasons in the, um, in, in the reported newspapers that, um, um, we used to collect the data. Uh, other types of processes, like you know, for instance, the gilets jaunes, uh, with the price increase in um, for uh, you know for, for um, trying to push climate, uh, the climate agenda, and and many others. So um, yeah, uh, that's definitely something that we're going to look at. Uh, but pr 
probably never in such a detail that we would uh, be able to, you know, uh, put our fingers on each single case study. Devanchi, Patrick, any responses to Marioka's um, points? Yeah, so uh, I was thinking uh, maybe Patrick can go on the question about the larger, you know, kind of sustain sustenance of the coal industry and the politics of it, and then I could kind of come back again on on why why people do or do not demand uh, more from the government. Yeah, for sure. Um... I mean, this this paper takes a very particular kind of household view of, of energy security, if one wants to call it that. Um, some some of the things that I've been looking at in <clears throat> sorry in, in in other work is is more related to extractive industries, coal specifically, land relations, and and uh, the national politics of environmental approvals and climate change and. Um, I mean, the very pragmatic national account is that coal cons continues because it is energy. It's the only domestic source uh, that exists and is feasible. Um, and then one can go on to talk about all sorts of different interest groups that pressure politicians into this, uh, whether or not the politicians themselves are corrupt or not. But there are very real reasons, more than 70 percent of national uh, energy uh, electricity supply in that sense is is coal so there's no doubt that you know what else they've tried everything else they've tried nuclear they've tried hydro they've tried wind power they've they are succeeding to an extent with solar power but whether that's going to replace coal or just add on to existing coal i mean that remains to be seen um so i guess that's the wider and, and then within this national you know continental system of energy one can look at the nation at the federal states that have quite a lot of independence one can look at particular coal towns or industrial towns which is more of what we explore here at all these levels one find somewhat bad compromises where different actors realize that there are very real costs attached to this system but it does provide jobs, it provides energy, heat for an, uh, industrial operations, it, it allows all sorts of things to happen. Down to, I, I was intrigued by one of the questions, why, why does, you know, this everyday collection of coal, yeah, so it, it continues, the coal trains go uh, every time, many times a day, but if you collect a lot in one go, you might come then to be seen by the police as as a commercial coal collector. And that's another kind of um, bad compromise. I mean, collecting coal is illegal and dangerous because it has to do with moving vehicles and national coal for national energy security. It's not meant for households. But if you just grab one or two fists yourself, it's just for your household. It slips under cover. A few people, not many, but some do collect by the sack load and by the cart load. But then they become commercial operators and they might not quite be part of this. Oh, we are not going to look if you just need to provide a little bit of household energy so that you can put food on the table or something like that. So that's a different kind of uh, bargain uh, among many other kind of, of bargains that one sees playing out. That's fascinating, Patrick. And I, I love this point you make about the bad compromises. This is something we arrived at in our own synthesis work on on the energy protest, which is a, it's basically a wicked problem. You know, everyone will take to the streets when you when you increase the prices, but that's not a it doesn't yield any good solutions for anyone either. You, know, you end up with, you know, unaffordable, un, uneconomic, unfair uh, energy policies, nevertheless. So that's fascinating that you say that. Um, Devanshi, you were going to you were also going yeah, to come in. Yeah, I mean, I was going to reflect on uh, the point about you know why is it that people just make do and don't necessarily ask for more from their governments. Um, I mean, I was kind of just thinking about that point with respect to you know cooking fuels and gas and and LPG and India's of course most of India continues to live in uh, rural uh, mm -hmm. rural geographies um, and of course now there's been urbanization. To varying degrees and varying uh, in across different states, but largely India continues to remain uh, quite rural, and and the gas um, subsidies have also existed for a very long time from the government, and most 
of the users of gas have been middle and upper class groups across india so the gas subsidy has over time, over the years gone to middle income groups or to 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 to, rich, to the rich in india um and they are the ones who were actually usually taken to the streets when uh when gas prices have increased and mm. you know we not got our 200 rupees which is about 2 pounds uh, 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 uh the subsidy has has disappeared or has now the price has gone up and so it's usually the middle classes who i mean it is often argued can well pay for this who have benefited from from the gas subsidy and a lot of people have argued for the removal of of these um, lpg or gas uh, subsidies and the poor have by and large done jugad always <laughs> you know like in rural india and in the urban context so i suppose the fact that now you've kind of expanded the net of gas connections but you don't really expect the state to provide gas because free because it's just something that you always make do you arrange you organize somehow or the other it's not something you demand from the state as an affordable price so i suppose i mean i wonder how this will kind of play out in the long run when more and more people come into the gas net but are not able to quite afford gas replacements but i would say that right now what you are witnessing is just an early early expansion of of the net and i suppose that also plays into i mean the poor anyway don't expect all that much from the state whatever little they get if you can give in terms of crumbs is almost accepted so gas i suppose is seen as something that they never thought about demanding at a fair price before but devanshi once it's been given then it becomes a a right right yeah but then you then it's only a connection that's given mm. cylinders never given okay. as, yeah so the, yeah <laughs> great well pedro some questions for you um in marioka's discussion but also i think alex left you with this zinger um the indigenous movement in ecuador is very strong was very visible in the 2019 protests which forced president moreno to back down to, he asked to what extent were divisions apparent between <coughs> pardon me indigenous movement organizations from the amazon where there's a lot of oil extraction and the andes where most consumers live in that mobilization did they succeed in establishing a unified discourse bringing together rights claims relating both to oil production and fuel consumption so that's a few things for you to tell us about. Yes, the question is uh, very related to Marioca's uh, comments. So uh, to approach that, I used to talk about the different meanings of nature or the discourses on nature. Uh, yeah, for the, what I argue is for the Ecuadorian state, uh, nature is uh, barely rather natural resources to be extracted and commodified and to bankroll the national modernization project. And for uh, social movements, uh, indigenous movements, nature is rather related to habitat, means of existence, uh, natural heritage, uh, where I live. Uh, they Okay, mainly the population, let's say the population in Ecuador is mainly human. Yeah. But there is, there is this positions or this discourses on nature. And uh, they are indeed antagonic, natural resources and nature. But there is a point in which these two antagonic discourses converged. Uh, and it was the so-called uh, Yasuni initiative. Yeah, it was an initiative to leave oil in the ground in the Amazonia. About uh, one fourth of the national oil reserves in the Amazonia were to be left underground. This was an initiative that, this was the idea came from the social movements, from the civil society and from uh, international uh, NGOs but the government make a state policy of this initiative and they launched the initiative in 2007 but the, the discourses converged yeah 
nature was to be to be protected because it was habitat and it was in the Amazonia uh, cultural sensitive and the most biodiverse territory of the world and, uh, but the government decided that it all was to be kept in the ground in exchange for an international monetary compensation but the government decided in 2013 to stop the initiative they, they scrapped the initiative unilaterally and uh, okay, they said uh, the world failed us they do not give us enough money and so before the oil boom is over we have to extract the oil you know and then yeah in order to support this uh, new policy of extracting oil the government uh, co-opted many indigenous leaders and used uh, clientelistic strategies with some indigenous leaders in the Amazonia. Yeah. Uh, so it was very paradoxical to see many indigenous leaders in the Amazonia supporting oil extraction. So because the offer was, okay, this is development, you know, with and the uh, former president Correa used to uh, use this uh, uh, metaphor of the beggars sitting on the sack of gold and say, with that money, we'll build roads and that's development because people will come to you and buy your products and you will have a job in the oil company or then in the mining company will have a job and that's development. And so the this was again these two discourses or on nature and that's a characteristic of the indigenous movements many leaders many movements and there is a confederation they just elected a president but this confederation sometimes does not support the political party the indigenous political party pachakutik that's what happened in a the confederation last of indigenous indigenous people or movements a confederation movement. of movements yeah because there are many movements in the coast in the andes in the amazonia and they have many many leaders and there's one confederation but which one political party which is sometimes not in consonance with the movement that's what we saw in the last election with mr Yaku Perez was the candidate for the presidency and some of the indigenous leaders said, no, we don't support him. He can do whatever he wants, we do not support him. But the, the platform of the, of the political party of the indigenous movement was anti-extractivism. Yeah. And there is an increasing anti-extractivist critique in the, in the indigenous movement despite of these leaders that uh, prefer some development. Yeah. But uh, a proof of this uh, anti-extractivist uh, growing stance is that um, Guadalupe Jori, an indigenous leader of the Amazonia, who was uh, in jail during Korea's government because she, she protested against extractivism, mining extractivism in the Amazonia, so then she was in jail for 10 months. She's now the president of the National Assembly. So she represents women and represents anti-extractivism, which is a new, a, let's say a main train in the, in the uh, in indigenous uh, movement. There is also, uh, okay, we're talking about the environmental part of this and extractivism. There's an, another problem associated to subsidies, uh, which is uh, air pollution in cities. In the main city in Quito, we are um, nearly uh, 3,000 meters high. Yeah, Only La Paz in Bolivia is higher. Yeah. So we compete in air quality with uh, Mexico City, which is the landmark of air pollution. So and we do not have, uh, we're very motivated to use the car. We, do, 
very cheap uh, gasoline prices. So when the two years ago, when the government scrapped subsidies on gasoline, uh, well, this the last 14 years, uh, dialogue was not a word on the top of the dictionary of the government. So they scrapped the subsidies and riots came and they didn't know what to do. And they said, okay, let's call the environmental movement. And they called the environmental movement and they said, uh, look what we're doing. We are scrapping subsidies and gasoline and diesel. And that's very environmentalistic. <laughs> so uh, support us, yeah? Because we have riots, indigenous people are in the city and and they don't want to scrap the subsidies. So environmental movement, please support us. And environmental movement uh, said, no, no, I don't yeah. support you. Actually, we are Pedro, with the indigenous. Sorry, Pedro, I wanted to draw your attention to a question from Neil also for you. Neil, do you want to ask it about the what Ecuadorians think about subsidies? It's very relevant to what you're talking about. Yes, so what I thought you were talk was fascinating, Pedro, because it really resonated with certainly my experience in other countries, including Nigeria, where you've got a population, and this is what I wanted to ask you about, how Ecuadorians feel about subsidies. If you ask Nigerians what they feel about subsidies, as we did in a survey, um, they tell you that they are dead set against subsidy removal. Don't remove the subsidies. They don't want the prices to go up. And then if you ask them what they think, about subsidies, mostly they will say it's all corrupt. It all goes to the rich. We know it all goes to the rich. It's terrible and awful. And you say, well, why aren't you in favor of removing them? Oh, well, in that case, the price will go up and we don't want the price to go up. So, so Nigerians simultaneously know that they are not the principal beneficiaries of subsidies, but also strongly oppose their removal. Is it the same in Ecuador or is it different? Yes, what I argue in the, in the paper is that uh, Ecuadorian C as a right, as a quasi naturalist right? Because we live in an oil rich country. We live in an oil exporting country. And so what's the benefit I get from living there? It's my cheap gasoline. It's my cheap gas for cooking. And um, yeah, also the trust in the government is also marked by corruption. Uh, this was also a word in the last 14 years in the top of the dictionary. <laughs> Uh, instead of dialogue, for example. Yeah, and uh, we don't, we, most Ecuadorians uh, do not trust the government in the initiatives. We have a new government now for, since the 24th of May. Everyone is with high hopes, but let's see what happens. In, it's only the first month. Well, uh, the last government already uh, not fully scrapped the subsidies, but connected them, connected the price of the price of gasoline and diesel and diesel more to the price of oil. So uh, gasoline is uh, steadily you know, every month uh, rising the price. So but by now with the new government and the optimism, there's no riots, nobody saying much, but uh, LPG, gas for cooking, liquefied petroleum gas, that's the, the subsidy everyone knows. It removes precedents, <laughs> so nobody uh, touches it. And there hasn't been, uh, what well, there was barely an initiative of uh, replacing gas with electricity, but uh, distrust in the government uh, made the project fail. Yeah. I hope I, I, I yeah it's fascinating it really is very interesting I really enjoyed hearing about uh, Ecuador I mean this idea that you know you don't touch this sub subsidy because this is the, the, the president removing subsidy <laughs> I mean this is this is you know it's very it's very powerful but as, as I was saying with, with to Patrick earlier it's it you know this kind of wicked problem you result in is you know basically irrational sorts of public spending um, when uh, there, there might be better ways of doing things, but you're just kind of stuck in this in this system. But there are other perspectives on 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 subsidies as well. I mean, they're from the from the left proper. 
there is a you know a sense of why why is it in the global south people should be adjusting their energy you know they've hardly used any fuel or coal or petrol or anything compared to americans and canadians and brits and so on why should they be the ones not to benefit from their their national birthright their national right quasi natural right as you put it why should they be the ones to suffer because americans have polluted too much um, and continue to pollute so much. So I think those are also questions. Oh, Devanshi, I didn't notice your hand was there. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to understand what is the extent of the LPG subsidy? Because I, I mean, I was just kind of thinking about what it costs to run your kitchen for a house of four. If you were to run it entirely on gas in India, it would be about 10 pounds uh, for a house of four. And the government subsidy is about two pounds. So expensive. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to understand what it costs and what is the extent of the subsidy for LPG in in, in your communities? There will, uh, that's fixed. Uh, the market price, uh, the domestic market price is fixed by the government. A tank of uh, 14 kilograms costs $1.60. We are a dollarized economy, so $1.60. So the government pays in international markets for such amount 10 times more, Yeah, yeah? 10 times more. And we get it for uh, $1.60. So I, my wife and I, we consume 14 kilograms of LPG in six months, four months. <laughs> so it's, uh, it costs us, uh, yeah, let's say $5 per year. <laughs> And there, okay, there's many, many problems associated to that. One is uh, very rich people have uh, swimming pools and they heat the water with subsidized gas. There must be more control for that. And a very big problem also is contraband. Yeah? Our neighbors, Colombia and Peru, have international gas prices. So people living in the borders they smuggle a tank of gas and they get money for a week of living. So with four <laughs> tanks you smuggle, you have the month. Yeah? And that's a, that's a very big problem. I mean, there are some uh, initiatives, okay, of te technological initiatives, databases, you know, to, you are, okay, you live in that place, you need one, with 14 kilograms of gas, you get it. Uh, for a subsidized price, but if you have the pool, you have to pay more, and you have a restaurant, you have to pay more, and in the border, you can rationalize and control, but uh, it's still, or still in project since uh, the 1970s. <laughs> wow. Can I ask one question from both Pedro and uh, Devanchi and Patrick, which is, uh, uh, to what extent would you say uh, citizens, ordinary citizens, have any say in energy policy making at whatever level, whether it's local level, you know, subnational level or national level. You know, is there any citizen presence, any social movement or civic agency? I mean, apart from protests, I mean, formal, official policy spaces, anything like that. I would say that in India, they're certainly shrinking in a yeah. big way with the government, with the current government. Mm -hmm. I mean, also in terms of, uh, like when you say protests, um, the protests were often politically motivated. So it was basically the opposition's voice coming. So that was a citizen's voice because they represent the citizens as well. So a lot of the protests were led by um, political parties. And um, for instance, um, the current BJP government, when they were in opposition, they led very effective protests against um, against uh, gas prices, petrol prices. And now, given that crude oil prices have kind of fallen much, quite significantly from what they were seven years ago, our petrol prices are much higher than they were even when crude high oil prices were much higher uh, in India. And now you just don't find like the political voices which can represent the citizens are not, I mean, are not finding the space to be able to 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 have like a media platform or or even um, everything 
all all opposition is shut down quite a lot mm. so but i i think I, I think we we i think one of the things we is emerging out of our collaborative work our comparative work is that you know one of the reasons so many people take to the streets so frequently or have done frequently in the past is that they they there isn't even you know either political opposition doesn't take up the issue or cannot take up the issue effectively or there is no space for any kind of dialogue but specifically that when it comes to energy policy making it's a very elite very closed very secretive space where you know for instance in food policy making as we know in india there's there's plenty of participation by different movements different groups but when it comes to energy i i, I don't you know worldwide we see this you know food there's lots of space for lots of different organizations, which they have fought for and won over decades, maybe even centuries in some places. But do we see yeah, that I, with energy? I was thinking about food and the right to food campaign when before you mentioned it. I mean, educational campaigns, but I think maybe what Devanshi is also getting at is like, yeah, there were these broad rights-based movements, but they do seem to be a bit of a, thing of the past also those ones with this in, well that's the present political movement mo moment where it's becoming increasingly one person who has his name on every scheme and every program and every project um, including your covid vaccination certificate by the way COVID certificate um but i mean there's still something there with energy being quite technical and and i i i've never heard a broader claim to that otherwise I don't think one should see masses on the streets as in opposition to there necessarily being spaces in Indian politics. I would see it as there is an opening. That's why we're putting bodies on the line, showing how you're suffering and showing the weight of the masses. Everything is Gandhi. That's how you show that your claim is important and lots of people are following it. So it's not really an opposition that people are protesting. There may be. Also, a case that people are not listening, but yeah, I think it's a little bit more mixed, perhaps. Nice. But just to push you a little bit more on this, I really want to understand this in the India case is, you know, civil society, social movements, all of this, you've had right to work, right to food, right to education, as you say, right to information. But you don't, do you have any kind of right to energy movement? Is there anything like that? No. Farmers have agitated for a right to subsidize electricity, but that's the right to water and the right to yeah, irrigation. Uh, that's one type of movement. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's not. I would say the movement. Right, so we could have missed it to an extent also, but uh, no, I, I'm not aware of it. Mm. No, I would say the movements like against fuel price hike, diesel and petrol. You had like the city coming to a stand, uh, the country mm -hmm. coming to a standstill with trucker strikes and, mm -hmm. you know, like the, uh, the left parties on the roads, you know, like basically, and they had to roll back a lot of those price hikes before, but now they're just not able to do that. I mean, they're not, protests are not reaching people. Bible. Yeah, they're not. <laughs> and one last question about your case. Chhattisgarh is one of the Naxalite? areas now like you have a lot of uh, resistance against the state there i mean it sounds like a lot but it's in certain pockets okay. tiny pockets in the forest pockets uh, but yes it is one of the but resistance to coal uh, extraction or also yes in in, in those pockets okay. although in the next door state where we've been doing research uh, the maoists i mean they make money off of coal as much as they resist coal. Uh, it, it's, it's a big way of earning money. Got to finance the, your revolution somehow. Yes, finance the revolution and finance the state. I mean, that's one part of, you know. Interesting. Who Another, better to get people to pay up for safe passage than a illegal Maoist group? There's, there's even lots of them. And new people are spawning new Maoist groups so that you can uh, hijack some coal not really for revolutionary ideals. Some of them hold on to some sort of ideal of revolutionary uh, praxis, but uh, also they make money off of it. And not only this, but controlling all sorts of natural resources coming out of these areas, uh, forest products of various kinds. Another type of the natural resource curse, isn't it? Pedro, this same question to you about uh, 
you know, are, are there spaces for citizens to participate in energy policy that don't involve taking to the streets? No, rather not, I guess. Um, well, uh, against price hike, and it was very punctual the, when the government scrapped subsidies. Uh, there is, of course, this, uh, let's call it multi-centered uh, anti-extractivist movement, which is more uh, the environmental movement, middle classes, urban middle classes, uh, the academia, and indigenous leaders, uh, what uh, there comes a critique against extractivism, and mainly oil extractivism in the Amazonian mining oh. extractivism in the Andes, uh, and that's the platform to so anti-extractivism. So subsidies is not like a like a movement itself even this anti-extractivism and multi-centered movement is not uh, discussing subsidies. So anti-extractivism has a place in the academia and society, but uh, that's it, yeah. There is no bigger space than uh, the street. Mm. Great, a any other questions or comments from anyone here who would like to, Euclides perhaps comment on the dis differences with Mozambique or Nigeria or anyone else? Neil, you had some questions in the chat. Did I get to them all? I think you did. I, the thing that's going around in my head, and it's not a very well formulated question, is what the relationship is between people's struggles over control of natural resources and people's struggles against subsidy reform. I find it fascinating that these are in people's minds connected. As an economist, we love to separate all of these things out and say, no, those are totally different things, uh, <laughs> and, uh, which technically they are, but they're connected in people's minds and that makes them the same thing. And I find that really interesting that we've got a whole pile of issues of local struggles over, this is our right, and therefore people regard cheap fuel as our right. But, you know, do potato growing countries therefore regard free potatoes as your right? I don't know. It's, it's a strange thing to have a direct connection between a commodity that you happen to have a lot of and therefore regarding, uh, regarding the state forcing to give it to you for, for cheap or for, or for free. But nonetheless, that is an association that is in people's heads. And they're correct that the state has captured those resources and isn't sharing them with them. So in a people's opposition to subsidy reform is really opposition to the fact that they haven't been given their birthright. But I don't know what that, does that suggest therefore that one of the solutions to the subsidy dilemma, since for the most part, we agree that subsidies are not a good thing in the long run, if we could find a better alternative, one, alternative to subsidies would be an Alaska style giving people their birthright. You know, the country is sat upon oil, give everybody a check every year, which is the value of that of that asset. Um, and then say, but now you don't get your cheap fuel anymore. How do you how do you bring people their rights so that they're willing to accept? Um, uh, a more market-driven prices for, for everything, including for energy? I don't know what the answer. Yeah, good questions. And state capacity, you know, to deliver anything, as you said, but the crude, um, very easily uh, implemented fossil fuel subsidy at the petrol pump is is a key question. What, what states have the capacity to do this, I think, is really critical. Any other thoughts, any other questions or comments um, on each other's papers? Euclides, you have something to say, it looks like. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, it's just really a follow-up to, 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 to Neil's point and, and connected to an, um, an earlier point that uh, Devanshi made, um, which really raises the question. So if on the one hand, um, there is an acknowledgement that, uh, in terms of of state capacity, um, it is not fully there. And on the other hand, you have citizens finding solutions in every day. Um, so it, then we've got something 
missing for our, our, our social contract. So I'm, I'm wondering what kind of social contract is this? Uh, it's a one between citizens that kind of govern themselves in a way that they, they try to find ways of providing public service for themselves. Um, they expect they expect, expect the state to reach them very partially. Uh, so, I mean, just providing the basics uh, and then they, they complete the, the other half. Um, and, uh, and, and in a way, uh, it seems to, to me that uh, these states operate on the basis of that knowledge. So let's say um, we're just going to put the water pipes uh, or we, we, we're, going, we're going to put water source, so energy resources near the communities. And then they will find ways of uh, connecting, making the connections. Uh, those ways might be illegal, informal. So we'll sort that later on, right? So there is a, a state of affairs in which this kind of is a state promoted informality and provisionality in terms of, of how you govern. So there is no really a tendency of gradually providing full services uh, in a way that would, would adhere to our notions of, of, of social contract. So, so I, I, I've been just thinking, uh, what is it that we have? Uh, in what ways would these experiences um, lead us to, to rethink the ways we, we've, we've conceptualized uh, the kind of contracts that the, the, there is in the kind of expectations that they are from from both parties, not only from 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 citizens, because what we are learning yeah. is really citizens do not expect that much. Uh, and in, in case of Mozambique, uh, uh, there there are many many areas where really the citizens informally connect uh, to the to the grid, and they are fine as long as the state doesn't show up or the, the, the electricity outfit that doesn't show up to kind of try and regulate and then control prices and then determine standards and so on. Uh, and when that happens, sometimes that's when the uh, power outages also occur. So, so really it's, I think we, our material leads us to, to some reflections of, of this kind of state of affairs because what we are learning from, from interviews with officials is that they, they are aware of this, the uh, electricity sector, but also in the fuel and transport sector as well, as um, we showed in our presentation in, in the morning. I mean, there is a, a totally um, condoned, accepted by the state, a uh, system of public transportation that it has not been deemed secured or viable in any possible way. Uh, but in the, in the absence of capacity to provide something uh, better and when people really need to move, uh, those systems are allowed to exist. Thank you. I think that there's was... a really, yeah, really good, good, really interesting reflections. Thanks for that. And I, I do think actually that these questions of the social contract, the nature of the social contract and how it is, um, how it emerges or is formed or negotiated in relation to people's experiences of trying to get the energy they need from different sources and trying to cope with the supply that they have. And at the same time, development means moving towards more modern sources of energy. But meanwhile, at the same time, using the, the dung cakes and the coal cakes and the, the slinging a line over the energy grid, all the kind of different coping strategies that people have. I think it's a really interesting question going forward. I don't really know what the answers are here. Um, any final thoughts from any of the speakers or from Marioka, the discussant, before we end? No? Well, I'd really like to stay in touch with all of you, Pedro and Patrick and Devanshi in particular, um, you know, to continue discussions on these issues because I think it's been really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and I don't know what time it is where you are, but I'm, I'm ready for my second cup of coffee now. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thank been you. really great. Thank you so much, speakers. Really very interesting papers and uh, look forward to being in touch in future.